physicians are losing autonomy. So how do we get it back? Is it through unions, entrepreneurship, both? Stay tuned and find out. Hey, this is Brad Block, host of The Physician's Guide to Doctoring. This is a personal and professional development podcast for physicians where we have experts on the show that try to teach us everything we should have been learning while we were memorizing Krebs cycle. Welcome back to the podcast. On today's episode, we have a super special guest to talk about unions and wait till you hear his resume. So we have Dr. Barack Richmond, who's the Catherine T. Bartlett Professor of Law and Business Administration at Duke. And as of July of this year, July of 2024, he will be the Alexander Hamilton. It's hard for me to say that without singing it. Alexander Hamilton Professor of Business Law at GW. He has a JD from Harvard and a PhD from UC Berkeley, where he studied under Nobel Laureate Economic, Nobel Laureate in Economics, Oliver Williamson. And from 94 to 96, he handled international trade, trade legislation as a staff member for US, the U.S. Senate Committee on Finance. And his book, Stateless Commerce, The Diamond Network, and the Persistence of Rational Exchange, was published by Harvard University Press in 2017. But wait, there's more. And this is why he's the expert in the field that we really need to trust and listen to when it comes to all things healthcare policy. His primary research interests include the economics of contracting, new institutional economics, antitrust, and healthcare policy. And he's testified before Congress regarding competition policy and hospital cons consolidation. And he co-authored the American Antitrust Institute Institute's white papers on healthcare competition policy. So, Dr. Richmond, thank you so much for being on the podcast. That was an awesome introduction. Thanks for having me. It's a pretty good resume. So we're going to be talking about unions. And for those of us out there, physicians, I think we need to start really basic because we don't have this training in law and antitrust. Let's just start with what is the legal definition of a union? Yeah. So maybe after, after you saying all those things that I know a lot about, I should start saying some of the things that I don't know much about. So I'm not a union. I'm not an expert in unions. I'm not a labor lawyer. And in many ways, that's actually kind of an interesting entry point into this topic. The healthcare delivery system, mostly as an economist, also as an antitrust attorney. And one of the most pervasive problems with the U.S. healthcare system is that it has continually consolidated over the last 20, 25 years. Hospitals are buying other hospitals. Hospitals are buying physician practices. There's very little competition. So I come as a critic to the healthcare system looking at the lack of competition and in many ways the growing corporatization of healthcare delivery. Okay, one approach, one response to the consolidation of the delivery system could be applying the antitrust laws, preventing mergers, requiring hospitals to divide, divest from one another, um, splitting things up much like the Department of Justice split up AT&T about 40 years ago. That's one approach. But increasingly, the world of healthcare is kind of looking like the world of professional football. There is one NFL. If you want to play football, I mean, there are different teams, but there's really just one league. And I approach unions, organized labor, as a possible mechanism where trained professionals can come together and counteract monopoly power. So if there's only one hospital in town and you're a doctor, you're going to have to work for the hospital on whatever terms a hospital gives you. Just like if you're a professional football player in the United States, there's really only one league. But if physicians or by football players come together in a union, they can mobilize their negotiating power. They are not pushed around by the only employer in town. And they can collaborate with the employer in ways that just makes the product better. So I approached unions as a response to monopoly power. Now, what is a union? I mean, there are certain and again, this is not my legal area of expertise. There are certain areas where 
workers can collaborate without a union, but ultimately a union is a mobilization of workers where they can collectively bargain with an employer okay. or even with multiple employers. So normally you go to your boss, the two of you negotiate what your wage is. A union is a way where there is collective bargaining, where the one union representative or the team of union representatives bargains on behalf of a collective of workers. And that changes everything. I mean, it changes the way the labor market is structured. It changes the way an organization is organized and it changes the nature of work. There's a legal definition to what a union is. It's a mobilization of collective bargaining. It's recognized by the National Labor Relations Bureau. It's protected under different labor laws. But I think the more significant insight is what kind of economic structure a union is and how it can or cannot be really helpful on certain industries. So you're saying, as an economist, the legal definition is the boring part and the economic definition is the interesting one. That's an awesome <laughs> sum of what I just said, yeah. I mean, the legal definition is important for sure. And, you know, there are certain legal questions that you need a labor lawyer to answer. But the real question is, the real significance of a union is its economic significance. So then what's the counter argument? Because inevitably there's going to be a counter argument from the like American Hospital Association or and from large hospital systems on why unions are not good economically, right? Why it's going to negatively impact the system. And so what, do we, what should we expect to hear in that counter argument? Yeah, I mean, so labor economics is focused on these questions a lot and labor politics is focused on these questions a lot. And the classic story is the following. Employers push around labor and therefore labor mobilizes collectively and creates a union. The counter argument is that once labor organizes as a union, it's more expensive to run a business. And sometimes businesses have trouble being more competitive. And sometimes the consequence of a union are wage demands that are, I'll say, super competitive or maybe even, you know, above the market rate. So if we look at the auto industry, you know, before the United Auto Workers, it was not a happy place to work at a car auto factory. The, you know, data workers showed up. There was collective wealth in Detroit for a long time where both labor and management prospered. But one partly reason for that is that Detroit was the only place where they were making really good cars. Once there was more competition, that puts, comp that puts pressure on prices and it puts pressure on wages. And if you have a unionized workforce, it's harder to be responsive to that. It's harder to bring wages down. It's harder to fire people by design. That's not a, that's not a bug. That's a feature of a union, but it also makes the industry a little bit less dynamic or less able to respond to different economic threats. And part, that's why there are a lot of factories that were built in non-union states in Tennessee and South Carolina. That was a reaction to the cost of unions. Right. I mean, I guess the pensions that were previously paid to the union workers that were part of the reason why some of the auto industry failed. This from an ear, nose, and throat doctor, right? I don't know that much about it. You take, it for, take it for what it's worth. But yes, what you're saying, there's sometimes a cost to the business and the cost can be so high that now everybody's out of work because the union's demands were unrealistic and didn't allow the you to, to remain competitive. Right. Like, okay. That it could be because they were, it could be because demands were unrealistic. It could be just because it, with the unionized workforce, it was harder to respond to new pressures. It could be because you had bad management of the unions or maybe bad collective management with the unions and owners. There are lots of reasons. I wouldn't necessarily say that unions are a certain path to ruin, but certainly there have been a lot of economic distortions that unions have brought in and that create certain challenges. Makes sense. So why have there not historically been physician unions? Like, why is this something that has not happened up until recently? It's a fascinating question. Now, first of all, there... There actually is a history of physicians organizing. I think it's a fairly rich history, although 
measuring how extensive that history is, I guess, a, a matter of judgment. There, you know, physicians have unionized mostly in, with county hospitals, but you know, this is not a brand new thing. And unions are not antithetical to the medical profession. But having said that, you know, compared to other employment sectors, very few physicians have been part of a union, certainly compared to nurses, for example, also, where well, there are many nurses that are parts of unions. So I think there are a couple reasons for it, some of which are cultural, some of which are economic, and some of which are legal. Culturally, I think is actually perhaps the most interesting thing. Physicians, I think, for the most part, are trained or naturally are strongly attracted to independence. The idea of being a, a, a professional, a medical professional, is closely tied to the culture, to the psychology of being independent, exercising independent judgment, making independent medical decisions for their patients. I mean, part of this is hardwired into the Hippocratic Oath, and part of it's hardwired into medical training, but that notion of independence is very central, and that doesn't readily match with a union. Now, by the way, it doesn't readily match with being an employee to a hospital either. And that's right. one exactly. of the enormous you, challenges we have right now. The consolidation that you referred to is a fairly recent phenomenon, or at least to the at the rate at which it's happening. And so a lot of that independence, that autonomy has been so I mean that stands to reason. Lose the autonomy, the unions proliferate. I think that's exactly right. If this is a deeply seated cultural feature of being a physician in America, you know, having autonomy, having independence, then the last 10 years have really been a sea change, something that is very difficult to grapple and hasn't fully been grappled with. There are economic reasons for why physicians haven't unionized. There is a significant disparity in how much different physicians make. You think about a surgeon, gastroenterologist, neurologist compared to a primary care physician. And in that sense, it's very, the economics are very different from, say, a factory floor where you have people with different experience, you have people with different skills, some are more compensated than others. But all of this is very easily adaptable to a wage scale. Whereas with physicians, the incomes are very different, the incentives are very different, and it just hasn't naturally lent itself to being amenable to a collective bargaining unit. The, the third reason, so, that, so I gave the cultural, I gave you the economic. The third one is really kind of interesting also. It's the legal barrier. According to U.S. labor law, if you are a supervisor, you are not allowed to be part of a union. You're only allowed to be part of a union if you are being supervised. So what's that mean? I mean, middle they, management, they're supervising and they're being supervised by definition, right? By definition, if you're a middle manager, that's exactly what you're doing. and when a group of workers want to form a union, they submit a petition to the National Labor Relations Board. And one of the questions, one of the legal questions is, are you employees or are you supervisors? And you just gave me a great example, a middle manager, of how it's hard to categorize an individual in one versus the other. Are they a supervisor or are they not? But that's kind of what the law does. The law is about drawing lines. And historically, especially with some important cases in the 90s, 80s and 90s, there were key decisions that expanded the category of who was a supervisor and thereby limited the category of people of who was an employee and who could therefore join a union. One very critical decision, which is something that I especially now really dislike, involved university faculty. And the decision was that university faculty are supervisors. They therefore cannot unionize. Now, I don't know if I want to be part of a union. I just don't know if that fits my employer play workplace. But I can tell you, I don't feel like a supervisor. And I imagine a lot of your listeners are going to feel the same way. Like on one hand, they supervise a lot of people. They might not fit into the legal definition of an employee who can be a member of the union. But they probably don't feel like they have the kind of autonomy an independent contractor or a non-employee has. And they don't have hiring or firing power, right? You're like, you're not a supervisor in that you're, yes, people work under you, but you don't have the ability to give them raises or 
grant them more vacation time or hire them or fire them. Like in all of the ways that you might have leverage over someone where I would think they would want you the decision not to apply to you. We don't have that. So that's and really interesting. It's a multi-factor test. It's very, there's a lot of discretion to how the test is applied. And I think that one of the reasons that I'm really intrigued by newfound interest in unions by physicians is not just that it has the capacity to change the, how care is delivered and how care is organized, and we can talk about that, but it also, I think, has the capacity to change labor law. I mean, physicians are highly trained professionals in many ways at the top of the income and status chain, but maybe they really should be able to unionize. Maybe the law should really allow them to unionize. And therefore, maybe that means that we have to change the law. Wait, so, but there are physician unions. So you're talking about it like it shouldn't be able to happen. And yes, it's happened. It's happened yep, so at there the are, resident right. level. At the resident level, they're not supervisors, definitely. I mean, you're supervising other trainees that are under you, but that's it. But we do have unions of attendings now. And so how are you, how is that a thing? Exactly, yeah, yeah. I mean, for a group of physicians, obviously residents are easily not characterized as supervisors. And there are very few legal barriers to allowing them to unionize. But if there are a group of attendings that have been able to unionize, they've been able to submit a petition in which they've been able to say that we are not supervisors. We're not part of management. I know what the next question is, or at least the next set of questions involved. Well, how high up could we go? Because if we were to really take physician unions seriously, it would not just be about increase in wages or better workplace conditions. It would be about governance. It would be about making decisions about not just who to fire and hire, but about negotiating contracts where care, the right kind of care is being appropriately rewarded. It's about managing patients. It's not just about looking out for yourselves. And in that sense, it really would achieve its greatest objectives if it does have the senior most physicians involved in mobilizing a union. And that'll be a really interesting question about whether or not that threshold is pushed or that envelope is pushed. Yeah, that, that is interesting because then it seems to then contradict further that they shouldn't have a union, right? If now if they get what they want, then the union would have to be dissolved, which I think would be fine because then they've accomplished their goal. Like now they have real decision-making power at, in the workplace as a physician collective. And so that kind of obviates the need for a union. Well, the, the, the union would be one mechanism to have them acquire those decision-making capabilities. And I think the even senior most physicians at large academic medical centers, one of their biggest complaints is their lack of autonomy. Even if it's hard to really see them as being supervised, it's they most likely, they really appear to be much more a supervisor than a laborer they still are really lacking the kind of autonomy, the kind of control over the delivery system that they crave and that they yeah. historically have had. And, and that's why this union conversation could really push things in a new direction. It's interesting that we're not supervisors, we're the labor. And to anyone who's been involved in a potential transaction with private equity, it is made very clear to you that you are the labor, right? Because that's what they're buying. They're buying you. You produce revenue. Without you, there is no revenue because you are the labor. So as much as we go through school because we're highly trained and highly educated, right, thinking that we're management material, ultimately, no, we are the labor. Really well, eye-opening to think of it that way. I mean, sure, what, what's happened with private equity and medicine is eye-opening in a lot of ways. We see the harnessing of medical skill to create money in ways that we never really thought would be possible. We always thought there'd be some kind of restraint, but private equity seems to just to be hardwired to press through those social constraints. I mean, it, perhaps there's a little bit of an irony, even if these institutions, these private equity organizations are creating enormous wealth from physicians, they're doing it in a way that is exactly as you described, harnessing 
professionals as commodities, as yep. not, not people who are exercising judgment, but people who perform procedures, write prescriptions, have patients pass through them. It's about volume organization. And that's what they're looking at. Those are their metrics. They're in yeah. finance. Those are their metrics. Now, how many people did I help today? Did I leave the office feeling good because I helped a bunch of people? No. It's those are the metrics. That's a different. That's a different conversation, though. Actually, do, have you heard of any unions that have formed in one of these private equity-owned groups? Because no. I've heard of it in hospital systems, but now this recent consolidation has made a lot of physicians employees in one organization where collective bargaining would make a lot of sense. But your collective bargaining, yeah, I, I mean. One reason that hasn't happened yet is because private equity tends to be around only in the short term. They tend to mobilize. Yeah, by the time you've organized, they've already sold to someone else. They've already sold it to a hospital. Exactly. Yeah. Right. And, you know, and, and that's not only part of the strategy from the beginning, but I also think that timeline would be accelerated if there is a significant amount of labor unrest or labor mobilization. But, you know, I mean, the conversation about hospital... Empl hospitals employing physicians, and by the way, and say, you know, payers employing physicians, United, Kaiser, whatever, that conversation and the conversation about private equity in medicine, I wouldn't say they're two sides of the same coin, but they are certainly both part of a common phenomena where physicians are losing professional autonomy. And the, again, I'm not a labor organizer nature. I don't have a prior, say, you know, we need more unions, but we really do need to find better organizational forms for the delivery of medicine. And in a world where physicians are losing control over the delivery system, I just kind of think that maybe unions would be something we're talking about. Oh, definitely. And it's interesting that you said that you can't form a union if you have, if you're a supervisor, right? Because we're also talking about the new non-compete, you know, the FTC's ruling about non-competes. And the exclusion is if you're in a supervisory role as a physician, like if you're in a mad, like if you're CMO or CMIO, but you could also tweak the wording or interpret the wording in such a way where it's any physician with a significant amount of decision-making power over, you know, what happens at the, at the hospital. So those, it's interesting that the supervisor is really the, like the deciding factor here on whether or not if this applies to you or not. This is all exists for labor. So are we labor or are right. we not? And we can't have our cake and eat it too. I kind of think you can, or at least you should. And actually right now you're not having any cake at all. You're not eating it. Yeah. You don't have it. I mean, the FTC was motivated mostly to try to counteract abusive uses of non-complete causes, non-compete non causes for lower wage workers, where there really is no economic justification for it other than really having a leg up, being able to exploit the last dollars out of a low-wage worker. That was the FTC's motivation. And part of its rationale behind excluding you know, high-level physicians is because there's a presumption that high-level physicians can negotiate their contracts. And if the employer demands a non-compete clause, the employee can, in turn, demand a higher wage. That's the basic idea. The, the problem is that non-compete clauses do not operate in a vacuum. It would be one thing if, you know, you move to Cleveland and there are six different physician practices and you sign a non-compete with one of them. Or better yet, you move to Cleveland and you sign a non-compete clause, but that still allows you to move to Cincinnati or to Columbus. Now you have such consolidation that if you are going to navigate a non-compete where you're, go you're not going to challenge your employer, your employer now operates the whole state and the non-competes themselves in medicine are much more restrictive than before. And I think that missed the FTC's attention. Well, there's going to be a lot of pushback on it. So we'll see what happens in the next couple of months or I guess a couple of years with the speed at which this stuff moves. It might happen fast, actually. I hope so. But just another plug for my practice, I'm going to say it as many times as I can. We don't have non-competes because our place is so awesome, you're not going to want to leave. But, you know, it's only for ENTs and allergists in the New York, New York metro area. So because you have so much expertise in antitrust, hospital consolidation, we've been talking about unions. 
I'm gonna I'm not gonna hold you to this, but just as a way to close out the episode, I'm just gonna ask you to look into your crystal ball. And I want to know what you think we should expect from that perspective in healthcare over the next couple of years. Yeah. I, I mean, we got ourselves into a real pickle. Most markets in the US uh, are now highly concentrated. You have one or two hospital systems that are dominating it. And before, when I say before now, I'm talking about like 10 years ago, at the very least, you had physicians who are independent from the local, from the dominant hospital system. And that's really no longer the case. And, you know, look, this is not just about a lack of choice and it's not just about higher prices, although I can tell you that consolidation, whether it's hospital to hospital or hospital to physician, has led to significant price increases and in many ways are unsustainable. But it's not just that. We are now locked into a delivery system just doesn't work. It is a delivery system that is hospital based, whereas, you know, an allergist, you know this better than anybody. You want to keep people out of the hospital. You want them to you want to you want them to be able to manage their allergies. Yeah. It's a total failure if they have an asthma attack and have to go to the hospital. But if your revenue center is the hospital, that's not the kind of medicine that's being incentivized. So we have a real problem and we don't have alternative hospital business models that can compete with each other because of consolidation. So my crystal ball, I'll tell you what I, my crystal ball does not show. It does not show the government undoing all of the consolidation that has already happened. You know, it was probably would have been really smart to have had better enforcement to prevent the consolidation. Some of the consolidation that was especially egregious might be undone, but that's really hard to do. I, I think that the pickle that we're in, the way we got into this mess is not the way we're going to get out of it. We can't just turn around and walk back the way we came. We're going to have to be really creative. We're going to have to think about how we can deliver meaningful care, preventive care, high value care to communities almost by avoiding the dominant hospital. And that's going to be. That's going to be hard. It's really going to be possible. Maybe with certain remote technologies, maybe with the proliferation of telemedicine, different diagnostics, maybe, you know, people like you would be able to manage, help people manage their allergies, even if you only see them once a year or maybe even less. Maybe there's a way that for particular intervention services, you don't rely on the hospital nearby, but you have special destinations where you send people. It's going to require a lot of creativity. Well, to, to some degree, that's happened. Like my specialty, I'm an ear, nose, and throat doctor. We have we have ENTs and allergists in our practice. I, like a lot of what we do has gone out of the surgery center and into the office or out of the hospital and into the surgery center. So that migration is happening when the doctors have control over it. Exactly. But when you're an employee of the hospital and you're operating in their domain, then you have less control. But so we're a private practice. We're physician owned and run. And so we have a very different incentive structure. And so we are actually, we are incentivized to keep things out of the hospital, but they're incentivized to keep things in. And they're the, I mean, all that stuff has to happen on steroids. I mean, and you know, the technology is there. The know-how is there. In fact, actually, if there's any lack of know-how, it's not technological, it's more organizational or entrepreneurial. And look, you know, maybe maybe if physicians band together in some kind of collective, maybe it's a union, maybe it's something else, maybe that kind of human capital can really create the creativity or generate the new ideas that will allow to, to really scale the kind of things that you're doing on a nationwide level. I love to hear that. And I know my listeners love to hear that because entrepreneurship is a lot of what we talk about on this show. And I will tell you, you know, what you say really gives me, it encourages me, it gives me hope because I know from my network that's developed out of this podcast, there are a lot of physicians out there that have an entrepreneurial spirit. They're pushing things, they're creating things, you know, as much control as they've taken away from us, we're finding ways to take it back. And whether that's through unions or that's through entrepreneurship, like you're right, it's ingrained in us. We're independent. That's what entrepreneurship, I genuinely think, is a reaction to what's happened. So 
Thank you for encouraging us and those parting words that really, I think, hopefully will ignite some fire among some of the listeners to really take things, take control back from the hospital. So thank right, you very much. Your, your parting words are the part are the right parting words. That's perfect. I'm going to say an amen to that. Well, thanks again. Thanks for having me on, Brett. Thanks for listening. So please share it or like it or comment on a social media post or write us a five-star review. Thank us again for listening to the Physician's Guide to Doctoring.